So what drew you to the career of special makeup effects? Well, special makeup effects is something that interested me since I was the age of seven. Uh, I had a problem, a physical problem, with my back when I was very young. And I was uh, uh, ha having to stay either in hospitals quite a bit of that period, during that period, mm -hmm. or I was at home all of the time. So I watched a lot of television. And in watching television, I saw all of the horror movies that were produced by Universal Studios and various independent film companies. And I saw the original Frankenstein makeup as it was done by Jack Pierce in 1931. And I looked at that makeup and I said to myself, now that can't really be a person. That has, there's, there's something there. What is that? How is it done? So I sent a letter to the Max Factor Company. And I was a young kid. My mother was helping me do this. I was seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. And we sent a letter to the Max Factor Company requesting information on professional makeup. And they sent me a, a, a series of nine booklets on the art of makeup. And it was from those booklets that I began studying what eventually became my profession. Can you discuss a little bit about the history of makeup? Oh, goodness. History, history of makeup. Makeup goes back as far as Cleopatra, perhaps even before that. Mm. Uh, Cleopatra was known to have used uh, a lot of uh, uh, tints and vegetable dyes for her eyes, and she would polish her skin with pearl powders. And, uh, but as far as makeup is concerned today, makeup is, uh, as we know it, generally a, make a, a process of enhancing one's beauty in a natural way, but not in, a, not in an artificial way, as, as she had done. Um, the makeup for motion pictures and television began in the 20s, and it was with uh, grease paint, the old, the old original Stein's grease paint, paint, and then eventually Max Factor updated the grease paint. But it, it started as a makeup that actors and actresses would wear on stage, and they would take ham rind, which is actual ham fat, pig fat, they rub it on their face and there were sticks of pigment that they would use. And they would take these sticks of pigment, run it across through the ham rind, and then work it into their skin and then powder it down. And this is how the, the term ham actor actually began, because and, and, uh, they actually smelt like ham. So from that, from that early uh, beginning, makeup went from stage into motion pictures. But with the early black and white film that was being used, the orthochromatic processes, normal flesh tones registered very, very dark, and all of the shadows in the face uh, were very difficult uh, to photograph because they became almost black, and the lips would become black. So Max Factor originally developed a line of makeup that was called orthochromatic makeup, which was designed specifically for that film. And it was a yellow makeup, and uh, that was the very beginning of makeup for motion pictures. It was a yellow makeup, and the, the, the uh, lips were made up green, and they used a lot of red tones to create shadows. But uh, when they were working with one another, if you can imagine being a, perfor a, a performer doing a love scene, looking at someone made up with a yellow face and green lips, that's how it actually began, that way. Then, uh, as film progressed, uh, the uh, cosmetic companies, primarily, primarily it was Max Factor, and, and my, my cosmetics company was formed after the Max Factor company, and we we more or less took over where Max Factor led off professionally. And, uh, but it was, it was Max Factor who actually began makeup as we know it today, and it was considered the father of makeup products. Whereas Jack Pierce, who was the head of makeup for Universal Studios, was considered the, the father of makeup artistry. Can you, can you talk a little bit about um, the importance of, of, of realistic makeup on film? A makeup that calls attention to itself is of absolutely no use to the actor. Uh, you can imagine a, a, an actor is doing a very dramatic scene, and uh, if the makeup is overdone, or if there's a prosthetic appliance, a rubber appliance, or uh, uh, if, it's, if the makeup is done, in, let's say an old age makeup, uh, if it's done and it's overpainted, and it looks unnatural, and it looks like a makeup, then the audience is drawn to the makeup more so than to the performance. So it really, doesn't do anything to help that actor uh, accomplish what he's trying to accomplish, and that is to, to produce a, a realistic performance. So natural makeup, when we say natural makeup, whether it be a beauty makeup or whether it be an old age makeup, if it attracts attention to itself in a negative way, then it's not a good makeup. But when we're watching an actor, for instance, uh, one of my students, Matthew Mungle, in fact, two of my students, Matthew Mungle and Deborah Figley, were just nominated for Academy Awards 
for the motion picture The Ghost of Mississippi. And they did, on James Woods, they did this beautiful prosthetic makeup done with gelatin pieces. And it was the kind of makeup that absolutely needed to look very, very natural because in these tight close-ups, if makeup looked like a painted or a prosthetic makeup, then of course the acting became secondary. And, uh, uh, and it's the same with beauty makeup. When we're doing a, a beauty makeup, there are times when we need to do and we should do a very accentuated, very high fashion, very fantasy type of makeup. But those are stylized makeups that are used for specific occasions and for specific script requirements. Uh, when you're, we're doing a makeup to simply enhance a, a lady's looks, uh, to make her uh, appear as she does, but to overcome the technical aspects of, of the lighting or of the camera requirements, then in doing that, there's a specific technique that has to be done. The colors have to be spe uh, specific colors to work well with the, the, the type of uh, film that's being used, with the type of television process that's being used, or with the type of lights or gels that are being used on the set. And in doing so, to, to keep the makeup looking natural, the colors that are chosen by the makeup artist must be specific colors. But it's the technique of application as far as eye makeup and lip makeup and the application of cheek color, the more decorative aspects of makeup artistry, that really will determine whether or not that makeup is overdone, unnatural appearing, or natural and, and uh, uh, enhancing to the performer. So it's really in looking at the makeup, you say, does this look real to me? That's really what it boils down to. Does this look real? Does this look overdone? Is there too much eyeliner there? Does it really look like a shadow? Uh, eyeliner, for instance, on the lower lid, we call that drop shadow. The liner that we put on the lower lid should really be simulating the effect that a shadow would be, that, uh, that which should really be simulating the effect of a shadow thrown by the lower lashes and shouldn't look like an artificial line drawn there unless it goes into the realm of glamour makeup or fantasy makeup. So to answer your question, a natural makeup is a makeup that looks real, is not noticeable, and is enhancing the looks of the individual. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on how lighting and makeup are married? What yes. is that relationship? If you close your eyes, you see nothing. It's the same as being in a dark room. If you turn all the lights off in this room, you see nothing. I like to think of makeup, or as a makeup artist, as being someone who sculpts or is a sculptor of light reflection. Because everything that we see is nothing more than reflected light. If that light, my key light here and my fill light there, were not hitting the surface of my skin and bouncing into the lens of the camera, the camera would not be able to see me. So without light, there is nothing. So what the makeup artist does simply is by choosing lighter colors of makeup to reflect more of that light or by choosing darker colors of makeup to absorb the light, you're able to create the illusion that there may be more light being reflected or less light being reflected, so that you're able to create contours. So that's actually sculpting with light. So without the light, the makeup artist has nothing to work with. Um. What do you think about um, the need for educated makeup artists? Well, fortunately today, uh, makeup artists are more adept at their craft than ever before. Basically because the, the craft itself requires it. When, the, when motion pictures and television were in their infancy, uh, just about anything could go. You know, uh, uh, today, however, I mean, the, the industry has become so demanding that the lenses that are used are so far superior to the lenses that were used in the past. The film emulsions are far more sophisticated than they were then. Uh, television processes, electronic processes in television have gone to a point where you're able to come in into a close-up in television and actually get a much more intricate result than even in motion pictures in some cases where it's blown up on a, on a large screen. In the old days of, uh, of uh, motion picture and television, the makeup artists would go through an apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the makeup artists were assigned to one 
other artists who would teach them for three years. And what we're finding is, is that when you are taught by simply one person, one technique, you know, you're not really any better than that one person. Only what you're able to put in of your own technique to, to help it along and to make it better. With schools for makeup artistry, which never existed before, and today I'm proud to say that our school is the number one school in the world for motion picture and, make, and television makeup artistry, with two schools, one here in Orlando and another in, another in Hollywood, California, we have married the techniques of many makeup artists together to teach these techniques to our students. So when a student leaves a school of makeup, they know not just the technique from one artist, but the techniques from many makeup artists, and they then are able to, to take their own creativity and couple that with everything that they've learned. So today, yes, we do have makeup artists who are much more educated, and because of the technical aspects of the industry, because of the greater demand for better educated makeup artists, we're able to supply that. That lends me to the, ne the next question. Um, what is, the, what is the, the job market like? It's very good. Uh, 20 years ago, it wasn't so terrific because we had, the major studios had makeup departments and the, uh, there was a limit to how many makeup artists you could put into a, into a makeup department. If there were 20 chairs there, the studio hired 20 makeup artists. But today, uh, there's a makeup artist on every stage and every production company has their own makeup artist or perhaps two or three or four makeup artists. And with the advent, of course, of, of uh, uh, cable television, you have hundreds and hundreds of TV studios and TV productions that need to be done in order to satisfy all of the need of, of cable television. So there is, there's a great demand for makeup artistry. And, but, you know, when you think of makeup, you don't want to think strictly uh, of uh, becoming a makeup artist only for motion pictures and television. There are many different areas that an artist can, can work in. There's uh, the fashion industry, still photography. Uh, even in salons, working in, in very prestigious salons in the major cities, uh, and uh, as far as even working in mortuaries. We have makeup artists that work in mortuaries that do quite well, and uh, their clients never complain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if you'll be able to use that one or not. <laughs> I've, had, I'd, I've had a few people that I'd, wish, I'd, I'd rather be working in a mortuary. Um, what, are, what do you think are the most complicated effects to, to, to create? What, you know, and and what, what, what makes them complicated? Right, as, as far as effects being complicated is, is uh, concerned, is it depends on the artist. It depends on their expertise. It depends on what they've devoted themselves to. What one artist may find complicated, another makeup artist may find very simple. For instance, there are some prosthetic makeup artists, makeup artists that do prosthetics, who would would rather die a thousand deaths than to even begin to approach doing a beauty makeup. And then there are beauty makeup artists that wouldn't even, they would never know where to begin to do a prosthetic. So it, again, this is where education comes in. In, in, a, in, a, in a school that's been formally geared to teach people makeup artistry, they're able to learn all aspects of makeup artistry so that then when they go out into the field, they have confidence in knowing that they are able to handle anything. So, uh, but then again, you still have specialists. And if I were to really out of being able to do all form of makeup, if I had to pick the one that I felt would be more time consuming, which would probably denote that that may be a little more intricate or a little more difficult to do, I would say that a high fashion makeup, perhaps out of the beauty makeup realm, would be more difficult to do in that area. Uh, a prosthetic makeup that required a great deal of detail uh, would be more difficult to do. Full body suits requiring uh, mechanics, me me mechanical uh, devices uh, and bladder effects, things of that nature, are more difficult to do. But in, in every area of makeup, there are the more easier types of makeups, and then there are more, the more difficult types of makeups, beauty makeups, old age makeups, bald caps, etc., etc. So it's, it's not just one makeup is more difficult than another. It's in every aspect of makeup artistry. It can either be done very simply and very basically, or it can be done in a very detailed manner. How did um, the idea for the Joe Blasco Makeup Center evolve? Where did that come from? Oh boy, there, there's a good question, I'll tell you. Uh, well, when I became a makeup artist, there were no schools for professional makeup artistry. Well, you could go to a college and take a class in theatrical makeup, but it, it wasn't being taught by someone who really knew 
or had worked in the industry. There was the apprenticeship program that was being offered by the unions, the theatrical unions, but there were only so many apprentices that would be accepted into that program. So I found myself knocking on makeup artist doors and, and uh, they would of course be very gracious, would welcome me into the, you know, to their homes, into the studios, and didn't mind me sitting in the corner watching them do makeup. Ben Nye, head of makeup for 20th Century Fox, uh, I worked with him as an apprentice after he retired from 20th Century Fox. I was very fortunate there to be able to learn from him. Rudy Horvatish, the head of makeup at uh, uh, ABC Television, I worked with him, and I was 21 years old. I'd sit in the corner and watch him do the makeup for the Joey Bishop show. And uh, uh, George Bow, the man who uh, is actually accred accredited for having developed the foam rubber, foam latex makeup, uh, I was fortunate enough to work with him for a year or so before he passed on. Because of the difficulties that I had personally in having to go to one makeup artist to learn beauty makeup and to another makeup artist to learn prosthetics and to another one to learn how to do a bald cap and another one to learn how to do old age makeup, because of that difficulty and because it was so difficult to get into the apprenticeship program and because I had been doing makeup for such a long period of time and had become rather adept at the processes and had been very lucky to be able to apprentice with these masters at that time, uh, I decided that I would help other people get into the industry because I had already gotten into the industry at that point. And many makeup artists would come to me and they would see me doing a bald cap or an old age makeup or a beauty makeup or a prosthetic makeup and they would say, gee, you know, you, you can do all, every one of these types of makeup. Uh, how, did you, how did you learn how to do this? How do you do this? Can you teach me how to do it? So I started to set up small classes in my apartment and I would teach uh, you know, one or two people at a time. And then I got the idea, open a school. So we put an ad in the paper, become a professional makeup artist, and voila, within two weeks we had a class of 12 people pulled together. And that first class, out of that first class, I have now, I believe, four Emmy Award winning makeup artists and two Academy Award winning makeup artists. So that's actually how it got started. It got started because I realized that it was so difficult for me to get into the business, and because the business was becoming more and more difficult to get into, these, these people who were going to be trained in makeup really needed to be trained in such a way that would make it easy for them to be able to be accepted so that they would have the confidence that it took to get into the business. So in setting up the school, I taught not only makeup artistry techniques, but I also taught them the politics of the industry so they would understand how to go in for an interview, how to deal with producers and directors, how to work with lighting people, how to work with cinematographers. So they had a, a very wide range of understanding, not of just makeup technique. That was the easy part, but it was teaching them how to deal with the other people that they would be working with. It, it became just as important, if not even more important, than the makeup techniques. Well, that pretty much leads me into my, my next and probably final question, and that is, say I'm, I'm a 10-year-old kid. What, is there anything, and, but I, I'm really interested in pursuing this kind of career. Yes. Is there anything that I can do now or areas that I can explore now to get yes to learn it's best to start as young as possible make sure you have a good camera take pictures of absolutely every makeup that you do experiment with every type of makeup product you can find it's important to have parents that are supportive and understanding that it is a good career to get into that there are many opportunities within the field and um, uh, they must absolutely ask themselves and be very honest with themselves by asking themselves this question, do I really love the field of makeup artistry? Because it is going to be the type of profession that one must devote 100% of their time to. And practice, 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 practice as much as possible, take pictures of absolutely everything that you do. And uh, as you proceed, get the best education that you can, absolutely, absolutely graduate high school, uh, take as many classes in art and sculpture as possible. Uh, oil painting, watercolor, all of that is important. Uh, uh, business courses. Uh, uh, things, for instance, uh, that will assist you in understanding more about makeup artistry. And there's one thing about makeup artistry that fascinated me, and that was is that makeup artistry suddenly became all-encompassing. It, it, it's a reflection of everything that there is in life. For instance, we're called upon sometimes to do uh, period motion pictures where we have to do Marie Antoinette or certain uh, characters from the past. Mm -hmm.